Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway here on a Wednesday, ready to talk a little receiver for K-State football. Uh, earlier in the offseason, D.Y. and I kind of talked about some different positions and everything else, and I can't even remember if we got to talking about receivers there or not, but either way, I, it seems important to talk about them because the receivers have seemingly gotten more buzz since Big 12 media days, and it's probably – good to talk about them in a different manner now because we know that obviously there are a handful of guys at the top that fall into the category of okay you've been around for a while now but you're waiting to take that next step jace brown is in a category all on his own because he was a true freshman receiver uh last year that ended up being k-state's best receiver by the end of the year but can he take that next step now to where he is commanding as a number one option there and then you have some other guys waiting in the wings that will have to play supplementary roles this upcoming season for k-state uh that got some shout outs at different times uh throughout media days and other moments so before we even get into the specifics of those guys and how you see each one kind of fitting what are your expectations for how k-state receivers perform this season because their plate's going to be seemingly more full than it has been in past years because Chris Kleiman wants them to throw the ball better and more often, seemingly. Yeah, I think that the expectations for K State receivers this year is probably to, I guess, as a unit, kind of take that next step. You know, you kind of finally have some consistency in the room with Matthew Middleton in his second season. And you have a bunch of guys that are in their second season with Matthew Middleton as well. So I think that you're kind of hoping to see the natural progression of guys like Jace Brown, Keegan Johnson, Trace Bivey, Andre Davis, uh, who were all at K-State last year. And you're kind of hoping that some of those guys really kind of keep improving, keep taking steps forward. And from Big 12 Media Days, it has kind of sounded like Trace Bivey has been somebody that's been kind of flashing. So I think that you're kind of hoping... And it's the one position where you're kind of, I think, the most uneasy among the offense. Like, I, I have trust that the offensive line can get it figured out because they always have seemed to get it figured out under Connor Riley. You know what you're getting at running back. You think that you know what you have with Avery Johnson. It's can, can he find a consistent target to throw the ball to? And I think that there's a lot of potential in this room. And I think that it has potential to be the deepest room that K-State has had under Chris Kleiman. But I think that there's also, that doesn't come with quite without questions. And I think that there's a lot of questions right now. And obviously because we haven't played a game yet, there's not a lot of answers. Well, you, yeah, you can have a lot of depth, but that doesn't mean that you can be absent of talent at the top. I mean, think about K-State basketball this year. You could make a case that now this has had Naquan Tomlin probably been on the team, but even then, like this team this past season may have had more guys in total that they could see the floor and maybe do some things to help you, but they didn't have anybody at the top like they needed. And you need you need to have both things. You need to have both options there. And they just did not have that. So I think you're right. K State is in a position where you can have a bunch of guys, but they can't all be, you know, threes and fours. You need some ones and twos mixed in there. And I think that K-State does have a, a large number of guys that in the right scenario, they could be a one or a two. But you have Keegan Johnson and Dante Cephas who are trying to prove that at this level. And, you know, the, the trend would suggest that maybe they aren't ready for that and never will be because they've been around long enough. And, Cephas, weird situation at Penn State last year. He obviously didn't when he was at Kent State. And then Keegan Johnson's battled injuries. So there's certainly reason to be optimistic about why those guys could figure it out. But, you know, you can ask the question, is that actually going to work? And we mentioned, you know, Jace Brown. It's one thing to, to do it last year when teams aren't necessarily acquainted with you. Every team is going to know about Jace Brown this upcoming season. He is going to be the number one target that they worry about in K-State's passing game this year. Last year, that just wasn't the case. It was Ben Sennett was probably number one, and then it was probably Phillip Brooks where they're telling people that this guy's been around for six years. He finds ways to get things done. And then, you know, Keegan Johnson was probably even up there at different points. Jaden Jackson, it wasn't till later in the year that he became a focal point. So 
you have a lot of that to to kind of play with and figure out and and deal with. But I overall I do agree that there is depth, and I like I like the K State receiver room because I think that there is the opportunity for them to step up, make some plays, and and take the jump essentially that they need to to help K State be a successful football team. Uh, but it, you know you can't have that worry that they may not actually do it this season or ever. And that is going to severely hamper K State. Although the one thing that we haven't talked about in all this yet is the fact that Avery Johnson is going to make it a lot easier on receivers than what any other quarterback would because of his talent. And then it also helps to have running backs like DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards, who they themselves can be helpful in the passing game, but also just being able to set up the pass with their dynamic running ability and everything else that goes with it. Yeah, that's a really good point. That was something that I was actually about to bring up was the one thing that this receiver room has going for it, like on paper without kind of like looking and saying, okay, you can build on what he did last year. You can build like with Jace Brown, you can build on what Keegan Johnson did at Iowa and even flashed last season at times, especially in the Texas game uh, last year at K-State. And you can go to see what Dante Cephas did at Kent State and hope that you can recreate that. The one thing that they really have is that if somebody can create space, there is probably going to be plenty of one-on-one opportunities because teams are going to likely stack the box to try and stop DJ Giddens, Dylan Edwards, and even Avery Johnson running the ball because I think that the run game will be pretty potent at K-State. So I think that with that, you're going to get a lot of one-on-one opportunities. And if you can make plays and get separation, that, that's the one thing that I think if you're looking and you're a receiver in the room right now and you're saying, how do I get on the field? That's going to be how you get on the field. Can you get separation or can you do the other elite thing that somebody needs to really break out and do? Because we haven't seen a K-State receiver do this on a consistent basis in a really long time. Can you go up and make a contested catch? Because I, I think that there's going to be times where it will be a third and medium in case it has to pick it up and it's going to come down to, can you make a contested catch? And, and that's where I think a guy like Trace Spivey comes in because he has such a big catch radius. Yeah, I think, I mean, we heard some, some different young guys get tossed out last week and Spivey's the one that's probably the most exciting because there seems to be the athleticism and people got to see him, you know, making a pretty nice play in game one last year against SEMO uh, that's certainly the the young of the really young receivers that hasn't made their way yet that I'm probably most interested in seeing how the outcome ends up going. Uh, before we, and it should be mentioned, like there were other guys that got their names tossed out last week. We'll see how viable you think some of that is. Now, in terms of individuals, before we go to that, if you had to predict right now who the top three receivers, actually I'll make it four, I'll make it a little bit more difficult for you. You got to give me the top four receivers for K-State uh, in the upcoming season. Yeah, and you can decide if you want to say this is what it'll look like. Yeah, we'll, we'll just make it b- what it looks like by the end of the year, how it ends up shaking out, because there's a chance that week one and two, it's you know in a it's done to be nice to people. So by the end of the year, when it's you know time to get down to business, uh, who is K-State rolling out there as their four most reliable receivers? Are we talking just like in terms of rotation, or are we talking in terms of like production? Because I think that's two different things too. Well, then, then explain both. Explain, explain your your thought process on that. Uh, in terms of production, and, and I think that I would lean with this four because I think that you'll probably see a little bit more of this fourth person than who I think will be in the rotation near the end of the year. Because I think that again, it'll just come down to. How fast can he pick everything up? Uh, but in terms of production, I think it would, I would go in order. Jace Brown, Keegan Johnson, Dante Cephas, and Jaden Jackson. Uh, because I think that Jaden Jackson will get some plays every now and then where he is one of the best athletes in the receiver room and can really get out in space. And we saw that a few times on jet sweeps where he really runs angry. So I think that you'll kind of see that. But I think by the end of the year, in terms of rotation, I think that there's a chance that Trace Spivey ends up being that number four receiver that comes off or that comes onto the field more than Jaden Jackson near the end of the year. But I'm not sure what the production looks like because I I think that there's a chance that there's 
a few games, especially at the beginning of the year, kind of like last year where Jaden Jackson was that touchdown machine to start the year, where I think that you could see that happen again. And then later on, it ends up being Trace Spivey who kind of takes over. Okay. I, yeah, I, I, I like that. And I get you're kind of playing the like you're playing the math game there with Jaden Jackson will get some of those early. He'll have the opportunities uh, and it'll build a path to where like K-State's going to pad the the passing stats, you would think, in that first game of the year against UT Martin. You'll probably have some chances to do it, you know, earlier on in the schedule as opposed to later. Um, I, I think you probably laid it out pretty perfectly. Uh, now, I, I've kind of voiced, I have a, you know, a tough time committing to saying that these receivers are going to make the jump that people want and think that they are going to. And I think that the K-State coaching staff thinks that they're going to be able to make. Do you have any questions on, you know, Keegan Johnson and Dante Cephas reaching the potential of what is kind of expected and needed of them right now? Because I, I don't think it's totally fair to put Jace Brown in that category. He's going to get a lot of probably pressure heaped on him because of his production last year as a freshman. But I think there's still room to grow. And if you get the same thing that Jace Brown did last year for most of this year, you might be a little disappointed, but I don't think you can be upset about it. I think the guys that are really going to have a lot to, you know, to have on their plate in terms of pressure and needing to elevate themselves is Cephas and Johnson. I think that there's a chance that both of those guys could reach their potential. I think that with Dante Cephas, kind of a strange situation at Penn State. I think that Drew Aller is really bad, which is why I pointed out last week that I thought it was funny that NFL draft or the NFL scouts love Drew Aller because if you watched Drew Aller at any point last year, you're like, wow, this is a guy that is was supposed to be like really good, and he really wasn't for most of last season. Uh, and then Keegan Johnson just dealt with injuries all of last uh, last season, but you're kind of hearing more that he is fully healthy and that he's starting to really explode. And, and I think that that's something that is really encouraging to hear. I don't want to pump the brakes on it, but I have a little bit of cautious optimism uh, because I really liked Keegan Johnson as a recruit. I really liked Keegan Johnson, his, uh, for his first season at Iowa, and then has kind of dealt with the injury bug since. So he stays healthy. I think that there's a chance that he, he has probably a higher ceiling, I would say, than Dante Cephas. Uh, but he, it's, it's all about can he reach that? And I think that with some of the other stuff with the passing game, like adding Matt Wells, who has more of a passing background than Colin Klein did, and kind of that what we've talked about with the run game, uh, having teams really worry about that and have more one-on-one -on -one opportunities, I think that that probably opens it up more for Keegan Johnson with his speed and his athleticism more than somebody like Dante Cephas. So I'm really intrigued to see how Johnson does. And I really think that he could, he's probably the one that is due to break out because I think that he could be potentially an all big 12 guy by the time everything is all said and done. If he reaches that max potential. Yeah. I Well, and we saw the, the flashes, as the season moved on uh, of what they want Keegan Johnson to kind of be and what he can do. It's just going to be up to, can he actually go out and make it happen? Because he had good moments specifically, I would say in the, the Texas game and the KU game uh, where he was, he was really helpful. And uh, we'll see. I, is Dante Cephas the biggest wild card on this team where yeah. it, it could either be, maybe we don't, we're not talking about Dante Cephas by game 11 or, we're looking like this was the steal of the portal era offensively for K-State football. Yeah, I think that if you look at the offense right now and you point out one guy that I say, if he is really, really good, K-State could be even more special than we think, it's probably Dante Cephas because there's just so much that's not really known uh, because of just what happened last year at Kent State compared to what happened at Kent State. But if he is as good as he was at Kent State, and even a little bit below that, because I mean, he's probably not going to be in that 13, 1400 yards that he was at Kent State. But if he can be like that 500, 600 yard receiver, I think that that's where you really talk about K-State taking the, that next step. And that's where you kind of think, okay, 
11 and 1, 12 and 0 is not crazy if they can find another reliable passing target. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he ends up playing. I it just that is really one of those where you look and you see how how bad teams wanted him leaving Penn State or Kent State. He ends up at Penn State and we've gone over it numerous times when talking about him to kind of qualify everything, but you know, Aller up and down results as a college quarterback and they also fire their offensive coordinator. So, uh, I, and, if and you want to try and say that Penn state was a Dante Cephas problem, well, Penn state decided that it was an offensive coordinator problem. So the offense was the issue. I don't know that we can individually blame the players. And maybe that's why it's also unfair of us to blame drew Aller maybe as much as we do, uh, in this situation, because we can just throw it on whoever the heck the OC was that now Andy Kotal Nicky's going in to clean up his mess. And if you want to be really, I think still kind of optimistic about what Dante Cephas could, can do and could do. If you want to be technical, he was number two in receiving yards among the wide receivers. Now, how much of that was the passing concepts and not being able to get open because there was, I believe two running backs and tight end in front of him. How much of that was not being able to get open? How much of that was their concepts? Yeah, I, I don't know. But Penn State did fire their offensive coordinator. That feels like said, that, uh, so. that almost feels like when it's set up like that, it's probably more conceptual. I'll I'll answer that question for you. That feels more like a concept thing to me. But that would just be going off of feel. Like I, even if guys aren't getting open, you're probably able to find ways to still get them the ball and not have it be, you know. Bill Snyder 2018, where you're it's one receiver's got 300 yards and everybody else is under 100 or something, you know. Uh, so I would throw there, and like we talked about, um, you know, when Cephas left Penn State, he was thought of as the better receiver out of him and Tez Walker, who went to North Carolina, and all the, the noise was made about not being able to play. And then Tez Walker, when he did play, was pretty darn good and electric for North Carolina. And and so I don't think like a guy like that, it, Tez Walker may be better than Dante Cephas, but he's not so much better. Like they're no. pretty close to being the same thing to where if that was the case, then, you know, Cephas wouldn't have had better numbers at, at Kent State. Uh, it, it would have been a, a pretty clear one-two there, but Cephas was the guy coming out of there. So I, I think that this is probably one of those things where, um, it's more likely than not that K-State gets him right and he's able to be a pretty productive piece. The questions just really come down to, is it going to be as a true you know, number one, maybe like what people thought when he went into the portal the first time from Kent, or uh, is it you know totally shifted to the other end where it's just kind of a, a busted out phase for Dante Cephas, and unfortunately you're not going to get the production that you want or need from him. And I will add to with kind of like this Dante Cephas talk that I think that there's a chance that all of the KCA receivers are kind of bunched up in that yardage uh, mark because I, I just think that there's you haven't you don't have like a con, like a proven number one guy in the in coming into the season so I think that that kind of plays a part and I also just think that there's so many weapons that can be used in the passing game. Like we haven't even mentioned uh, Garrett Oakley as a tight end that could take some targets away from the receivers and Dylan Edwards will probably take some targets away and DJ Gins will probably take some targets away. So I, I imagine that all of the receivers are going to be pretty even, which I don't necessarily think is the worst thing. As long as you can find that consistent, like third down red zone guy. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, that, uh, that'll that do it on the receiver talk. Uh, is there anything else with that group that needs to be known? Like you talked about, uh, you know, with Trey Spivey and everything. We heard Sterling Lockett's game, name get thrown out. Do you think there are any receivers in that Lockett area that are actually going to get meaningful game reps this year, or do you think that was just more of off-season talk? Those guys are still – a year away from actually being able to to contribute. I think that there's still probably a chance for Andre Davis to see the field. I, I think that again, kind of like Trace Spivey, it's how fast can you get up to speed conceptually? And again, like Trace Spivey too, it's uh, he is big and can you find a way to get him the ball and can he be a contested catch guy? Uh, Sterling Lockett is 
an interesting name. I, I, I don't know how much he's going to play a receiver, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if he finds a way to make things happen on special teams. Like if he's like that secondary returner on kick return with Dylan Edwards, it wouldn't shock me. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's good for people to know and uh, be aware of, and we'll talk more uh, as the off season goes on, I'm sure about what those guys will end up looking like. And also uh, some of the other stuff going on positionally with K state. So that will do it for us today. We will come back later this week. We'll talk about another uh, group of guys somewhere on the roster uh, on on Friday, but tomorrow we'll go with our weekly recruiting show, get kind of the update there. Uh, we talked about it a little bit on Monday when we did the, the Ashton Moore breakdown, but we'll go a little bit deeper into the 2025 class, and Drew also just put out his 2026 big board. So if you want to look at that and get yourself prepped for everything going on, uh, tomorrow on KSO, go to on three, find K state online, and you can read all of Drew's stuff with recruiting DY. I know also, uh, did a little bit on factor fiction this week with recruiting. So a lot of that conversation happening right now over at kstateonline.com for Drew Galloway. I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for